Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel and to the latest in the series of videos where I talk about some of the reasons behind some of the requirements for electrical installations here in the UK. And in this video I wanted to talk specifically about ZS. Should we calculate it or should we measure it? And this is a subject that I've seen debated a lot on social media recently so I wanted to make a video just to give my opinion on the subject. Now in my opinion it's not a case of one versus the other. There are benefits of calculating ZS and there are benefits of measuring ZS. So the main benefit of calculating the ZS by adding the measured ZE to the measured R1, R2 is that we get to see um, if the circuit complies with the maximum ZS without relying on any parallel paths that may exist. And this is really important to make sure that the circuit complies with the maximum ZS and the maximum disconnection time. Now the effect of parallel paths is mentioned in guidance note 3 and if you have a look on uh, page 42 it's mentioned there and there's a paragraph that says parallel earth paths and the effects on test readings. And it's really important that we understand this because when we measure ZS we do so with the insulation energised and obviously all earthing and bonding has to be connected at the time so there may be parallel paths that exist. Now there are various things that can affect the accuracy of earth fault loop impedance testers and this is mentioned also in uh, guidance note 3 um, on page 112 and it talks about instrument accuracy. One thing to bear in mind is if the circuit is supplied via an RCD, which is likely to be the case nowadays, um, the way that loop impedance testers measure the ZS without tripping the RCD is often by using a lower test current than you would use when you're doing the high test current on a ZE, for example. So this can affect the accuracy of earth fault loop impedance meters. So it's useful to be able to calculate the ZS as well. Now having said this, there are also benefits in measuring the ZS. For example, it allows us to go from point to point and measure the ZS at each socket or each lighting outlet, for example, to make sure that there are no issues midway along the circuit, which you might not find if you're calculating the ZS to the furthest point in the circuit. I've had lots of situations where I've tested a double socket and the outlet on the left-hand side is fine, but the outlet on the right is much higher, which is obviously a faulty socket which wouldn't be picked up by a calculation. So that's one example of how testing has its benefits as well as calculating it. So if you've ever wondered, should I calculate the ZS or should I measure it? In my opinion, it's not just a case of one versus the other. There are benefits from calculating it and there are benefits from measuring it. And it's important for us to understand the differences between the two. So what I would do personally is I would follow the sequence of test, which is in guidance note three. I would start with the continuity of protective conductors, the R1, R2. And the reason that we always start with that is to make sure that it's safe to go ahead and carry out the other tests which pass the current down the circuit. So by the time you get to the ZS, you already have the values for R1, R2. So what I would then do is go ahead and measure the ZS. And if I notice any problems with the readings, I can then refer back to the readings that I've already taken and compare the two. So for example, if you measure the ZS and you get a reading that's lower than the R1 plus R2, and you think, well, that can't be right, it's quite likely that you have a parallel path which is leading the readings down. So in that situation, what I would do is I would go back to the test sheet, I would look at the R1, R2 and add it to the measured ZE and just to make sure that the circuit complies with the ZS without relying on any parallel paths. Also, you may find that you might measure ZS and you might find that the reading is higher than it should be and that might indicate that there's a spur in the circuit or it might indicate there's a problem that requires further investigation. I've also heard people say that calculating the ZS is safer than doing the live test. Now, this is something obviously that we have to assess. It's not something that I can uh, advise you on because obviously each job is different, each site is different, and it's something that we have to weigh up each time. So to summarize, I would say that if you follow the sequence of tests as per the IET's guidance note three, start with the R1 plus R2, go through the sequence, so when you get to measuring ZS, you can look back at your records and you can compare the measured R1 plus R2 and add it to the measured ZE to, to calculate the ZS. And that will give you an idea as to whether that circuit complies with the maximum ZS and the maximum disconnection time without relying on any parallel paths. I talk about maximum ZS in another video on my channel. And if you haven't already seen it, I'll put a link at the top of the screen. Great. 